Thank you for your grace, which is beyond all sin. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love, your love to the loveless, your love to enemies of yours. Thank you, Lord, and help us to understand that and to appreciate it and walk in the fullness of your grace and fully surrender to you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, our message is discouragement. Discouragement. Has anybody in here, you can raise your hand, feel free to raise your hand. Have you ever been discouraged? <laughs> Come on, you've never been discouraged? Has anybody in here ever been discouraged? Yes? If you haven't, I was going to ask you if I can get your DNA and clone you or something. <laughs> Because I think we've all been discouraged at times. I, I don't know anybody who hasn't. If you haven't yet, hold on. <laughs> you will be tempted to be even if you're not. Sometimes life is a little bit difficult, and sometimes it's not really that difficult, but it's just the battle is in our minds. Amen? Isn't that the truth? Sometimes if you really would step back and say, hey, and, and I know because I've been tempted with discouragement many times, and I step back and I say, why? I have a job, I have a house, I have a wife, I have a family, I have kids. I have, like, why do I feel this? Because it's an attack of the enemy. It's not so much about what you're going through. It's what the enemy tries to make of what you're going through. Isn't that true? How many times have you been discouraged and you find out it's about 90% imagination? Like, it's not really that you're facing all this, but your mind builds it to be even more than it is. And all things being relative, sometimes people say, well, I'm going through a financial crisis. But if you would take that and you would compare your situation to other parts of the world, you'd probably say, I'm not in a financial crisis. I have a roof over my head. There's people who have no roof have no clothes and no food. They're going through a financial crisis. Mine is not really a crisis. It's a little bit of a bump in the road. But our minds sometimes build it to be more than it is. But there are times when we really go through some trying circumstances. It's not just imagination. It really is a real battle. You know, sometimes, speaking of imagination, this man said uh, he kept going to the psychiatrist. He went to several psychiatrists and he said, I've always had an inferiority complex. So they ran a whole battery of tests and it took a few months. And we'll call him Mr. Jones. They came back and said, Mr. Jones, we've run every psychological test we know. You do not have a, an inferiority complex. You really are inferior. You know, that would be, that would be a sad thing to hear. But, that wouldn't be imagination. And sometimes you say, my trial really is difficult. You know, sometimes people are going through some hard physical battles. They're going through some family situations that are very trying. And so it is a real trial. And many trials are very real. But if you stop and think, we look at the Bible sometimes and we think we've got all these superheroes. They were normal people, just like us. They went through hard and trying circumstances just like we do. And let's look at some of them. And I want you to see a pattern of something I've noticed in my own life. I've noticed in the lives of people that I talk with who are Christians. And I really notice it in the Bible too. Let's start out in Numbers 21.4. I'm going to read one verse there. Or two verses. This is the children of Israel. And they've come out of Egypt. And they've been journeying, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Eden. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. It's the hardness of the way that has caused their discouragement. But I want you to notice something that had just taken place. We're going to back up to verse 3 and see what had just happened in their lives. They had cried out to the Lord because of a strong enemy, 
And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities and he called the name of the place Hormah. They just won a fantastic victory. If you back up from there, they had been thirsty and God brought water out of the rock and gave them drink. If you continue to back up, they were slaves in Egypt for 430 years, beaten under hard taskmasters, made to labor tremendously. When their beautiful women would be seen by Egyptians, they would just take them for spoil, and you had no choice. You were slaves. And God delivered them and showed them 10 judgments upon the gods of Egypt, delivered them with a high hand, opened the Red Sea, led them by a pillar of cloud in the day, led them by a pillar of fire at night, destroyed the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. And now the path is a little bit tough and they're discouraged. Have you ever noticed that in your life? God does some great things for you and shortly after that, the enemy attacks and you are tempted to be discouraged. After that, that wonderful high you had, let's call it a high, you were praising God. You were so thankful that the Lord had answered prayer that he had done so much. And the next week or a few days later, you feel this horrible feeling and you're tempted to be depressed and discouraged. Do you ever have that? I've noticed that in my own life and I see it here with Israel. I mean, they have seen some unbelievable miracles. They've been cared for. And now because the way is a little bit rough, they're discouraged. Let me give you another example. You've heard of the prophet Elisha, right? He was the successor of Elijah. God used him in a mighty way. Ahab and Jezebel are in office as king and queen. The nation, basically, they're kind of halting between two opinions, whether to serve God or serve Baal. Baal is the prince of the demons. Serve the devil is what it is. Either way. And people say, well, I'm not worshiping the devil. I just have a different God. You're either, you're either serving the devil or you're serving the Lord. It, those idols and all, believe me, they're the devil. So he had a showdown on Mount Carmel. God told him to call forth all the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, and build two altars and lay a sacrifice on the altar and let them pray to their God. He said, you can go first. Pray to your God to send down fire and consume the burnt offer, the offering if he's a God. Oh, they carried on all day. They cut themselves with lancet. They're bleeding all over. They're dancing around. They're begging. And Elisha starts mocking him. He says, cry a little louder. Maybe he's on the toilet. You know, that's really the way it's interpreted from the Hebrew. Maybe he's on the toilet and he can't hear you. Maybe you just need to yell louder. And they yell and they carry on until they fell exhausted. And then right on time, at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elisha comes forth and he prays a real short prayer. Let them know that you are God, that I'm your servant, and I've done all these things at your word. Hear, O Lord, and the fire. And before he did it, here's the, here's the remarkable part. He said, take four barrels of water and pour them on the sacrifice and all over the wood. And they did it. And he said, take four more. And they did it again. He said, take four more. Twelve barrels of water till the water is in the trench all around the, the offering. Everything's soaking wet. Then he called and the Lord set down fire and consumed the sacrifice, licked up all the water, and the people all fell on their face and said, the Lord is God, the Lord, he is God. You can't ask for a better, I mean, you talk about a service that's well attended, all Israel's there, all the 450 prophets of Baal, just, and then all the people fell down and said, the Lord is God. That's a pretty powerful message, and they accepted it, and they killed the 450 prophets, but Jezebel, she said, the Lord do also to me if, if Elisha is not like one of them by this time tomorrow. You're a dead man. So he went into the wilderness, and what did he do? He got discouraged. He sat down and said, Lord, take my life. I'm not better than my father's. I try to serve you. I worked so hard. I try to do the right thing, and what good did it do? You know, now they seek my life. And I'm the only one left that serves you. And the Lord said, you're not the only one, but how do you think you're the only one? I've, got, I've reserved 7,000 people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 
You think you're the only one? I'm all alone in this? No, your brothers and sisters are going through the same situations many times. And God encouraged him. But here's a prophet. After a great victory, he's discouraged and wants to die. Because that's what happens in our lives. God is always, always faithful. He always hears us. He always watches out for us. Even when we don't even pray, he knows what we have need of before we ask. The Marine Corps says, Semper Fidelis, that means always faithful. Semper Fi, I've got that in my bedroom on different stuff because I had two sons who were Marines. And every time I see Semper Fidelis, I think God is always faithful. And now I have another one. My son's patch says, Semper Vigilante. It means always vigilant. And it's kind of a reminder, so I'm saying God is always faithful, and he's always vigilant, and he helps me be vigilant. God is everything. Jesus Christ's work is everything. It's not about me, it's about him. Do we have reason to be discouraged? No. Are we tempted to be? Yes. We have a decision to make. If you start basking in it, you will spiral down. And you will get more and more depressed until you can't get out of it. It takes, you really have to trust the Lord. But if right away you cast down imaginations and you rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus, you don't have to go down. The Lord will hold you up. Let's look at some examples further now. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 1. We're going to hit 2 Corinthians a couple times with the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. God used him in a mighty way. He opened his eyes to his grace. And he's using him to preach to people all over the world. Great evangelist. And he says this to the people in Corinth. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. Have you ever been in a situation like that that was so hard? You feel totally crushed, you feel overwhelmed, and you think, I can't live through this, I can't do this. This is more than I can bear. It's more than I can endure, I can't possibly. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. I feel like I'm going to die, but I'm going to rely on God. And you know what? If God, so be it, if I die, he is able to raise the dead. I'm going to rely 100% on him. And that's what these trials do. So many times when we think, I can't go on, this is crushing this is overwhelming. I can't bear it. I can't endure it. I feel like I'm going to die. God is teaching us that we can't do it. They have to let him do it to rely 100% on him. And that's what he wants us to do always. I think when we get discouraged, it's because we don't realize how much we've started leaning upon ourselves, our own wisdom our own strength, our own abilities, our uh, ability to even talk our way through something, to negotiate, and that doesn't work. And finally, we come to the place where we throw our hands up, and that's what the Lord is waiting for us to do so he can show us his mighty power. We trust in God who raises the dead. Because the apostle Paul was no sissy, he was, a, he was a strong man, but he realized through this all, if I'm going to do this ministry, it's going to have to be the Lord because what the attacks that come against me are greater than I can possibly bear. In fact, he said at one time that he had this messenger of Satan to buffet him. Now, buffet means hit and release, hit and release, hit and release. He said, three times I went to God and I said, please take this away from me. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. And let's remember that. His grace is sufficient for us. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. He said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my abilities, no, glory in my infirmities, 
that the power of Christ may rest upon me, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So you see, he says, I would rather glory in my infirmities. No, I'm not able. No, I'm not wise. No, I'm not strong. But the power of Christ rests upon me, and he has made unto me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He is my strength. When I am weak, then am I strong. And we can say the same thing. We don't have to be weak and discouraged. We can be more than conquerors through him that loves us. Now he goes on to say in verse 10, And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him. Now that's easy to say. We say that all the time. Oh, I'm trusting God. And, and the Lord would have to say, no, you're not. You're including me in your trust, but your trust is basically in you or a loved one or a friend or, or your finances or something. Your trust is not really in me. People say, oh, you know what? I know things are getting bad at work, but I'm trusting the Lord. And they've got 100000 in the bank. So they, they kind of trust in the Lord to fix it, but they know, well, I've got 100000 in the bank. But what if you had nothing in the bank? What if all of a sudden the 100000 got blown away, and then you'd see if you're really trusting the Lord? See if the faith is still standing when the props are all gone. A lot of time people... As long as the reports look good, you know, you do have a physical situation, but there's something we can do. We're all right. But when they say there's nothing could be done, now all of a sudden, our confidence is shaken. Now, God's not changed. God has not shaken. He's not taken back, and he's not surprised. I was just talking to Glenn before his service about a friend of his who has cancer, and I was, I always think about, his, his nephew, Stephen, the night he was supposed to die, he's going to die within hours with leukemia. And I mean, he was in bad shape. The Lord raised him up, healed him. He went on to play basketball at Wilmington University, played with the Harlem Globetrotters. He's a healthy man with a family today. He's in his last hours, and God raised him up. A hopeless situation. God does that all the time. We think, oh, that's so rare. You mean God actually did something? People are like amazed. Wow, no to praise. God answered prayer. Somebody said to me one time, you don't seem so excited. I thought, well, you seem like you didn't expect it. Maybe I was expecting this. Not that I have that great faith all the time, but I'm saying if we're expecting victory, it shouldn't be so shocking. God did something. We should be shocked when it doesn't happen. God is a faithful God. Even when we're not faithful, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. He is going to see you through. He is going to carry you through. Like that poem, The Footprints in the Sand, the person looked back after their life and saw footprints and said, I noticed your footprints were beside mine, but in the hardest times of my life, there's only one set of footprints. Why did you leave me, Lord? And he said, my child, I would never leave you. Those are the times I carried you. And he does when we can't go on, when you feel you can't go on. When, the, when they were practicing beforehand, I had to go over in the office or something, and Karen Davis used to sing here, and she used to sing a song, when you feel you can't go on, praise the Lord. When you have a broken heart, just praise the Lord. Greater is he that is in me, he can take the hurt away if you just praise the Lord. Just start praising Praise is so important. So Paul says, and he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. This isn't a one-time thing. God doesn't say, there, you get three of these in a lifetime. He does it constantly. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us every single time. But do we believe that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is definitely a gift. It's not something you muster up. But we need to, if we're struggling with belief, we need to cry out to the Lord. You, um, let, me, let me just back up. You remember, I don't know if you remember in Mark 9, Mark chapter 9, there was a, I, I just thought of this, uh, the Lord just brought this to my mind. There was a man who had a, a son and he was demon possessed. And he came to Jesus' disciples 
Now they just had come down from the mount and saw some glorious things. And uh, he came to Jesus' disciples and uh, he asked them to cast the devil out of his son. And so he came to Jesus and said, Master, I, I need help. He said, my, my son is a lunatic and the devil's been trying to destroy him since he's a little child. And I brought him to your disciples that they could cast out the devil and they could not. But if you can do anything, will you have compassion and help us? Your disciples couldn't. But if you can do anything, you know what Jesus said? If you can believe, not if I can do anything, if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes. Not if I can do anything, if you can believe. And so he brought the sun over, and the sun's foaming and all, and Jesus said, how long ago is it that it came unto him? He said, of a child, and often the devils cast him into the fire and into the water. I, I'm walking with a kid, and he jumped in a fire, and I'm trying to put the fire out. This has been a horrible life. This kid jumps into a fire, and he's trying to burn to death because he's demon-possessed. And, and it's so stressful. And then I'm walking by a lake and he jumps in the water and the devil tries to drown him into the fire, into the water. It's been such a tough time going to raising this kid who's trying to, the devil's trying to destroy him. So please, if you can do anything, help us. And that's when Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And he cried out with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I choose to believe. Please help my unbelief. Help me to stop doubting you and believe you. And Jesus said, bring him over. And he brought him over and he commanded the devil come out. And he fell on the ground foaming and wallowing so badly, worse than before. And Jesus didn't go, oh my gosh, it's gotten worse. See, that's what we do. Oh, we got a good report today. And then the next thing you know, oh God, it got worse. I don't know what to do now. And Jesus is just sitting there. He commanded the devil to come out. He's not rattled. The devil's trying to, to fluff up and he's puffing up and everything, making the kid wall or not kid, he's a man probably. He's flopping all over, foaming, and, and then he just went dead. And everybody said he's dead. He just went still. Jesus is still not rattled. He already commanded the devil to come out. Jesus just touched him and raised him up and delivered him to his dad. If we're struggling with believing, we just need to cry out to God and say, help my unbelief. Help, help me to believe. I need you to give me the gift of faith because I'm struggling. And then study the word. Get on the word. Faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Look at the promises and then, oh, but you know what? Maybe it's not God's will. That's baloney. I get so tired of hearing these Preachers and others say, well, maybe it's not God's will. That's nothing but unbelief. Don't go covering for your unbelief. Oh, maybe it's not. Well, maybe it's not God's will for people to be saved either because the same work on the cross covered salvation and healing. Oh, no, that was spiritual healing. Then, then Jesus is a liar because in Matthew it said Jesus went about healing the blind, the lame, the halt. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He lists all these physical elements and then says that it will be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah in Isaiah 53. So don't play those games. It's not, oh, maybe it's not God's will, because it definitely can't be anything on our part. It is not God's will for us to be sick. It is not God's will for us to be defeated or to live in sin or to perish. It's not God's will. It's God's will for us to be saved. It's God's will for us to be healed. It's, oh, Jesus put me in a wheelchair so I could prove that I could be happy in a wheelchair. No, he didn't put you in a wheelchair. People come all the time, I don't believe in God because he made my mom die of cancer. Jesus didn't make your mom die of cancer. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with them. So don't blame God for the devil. It's like the insurance company. Oh, lightning hit your building, that's an act of God. I said, it wasn't no act of God, that's an act of the devil, now pay your insurance. Don't try to get out and blame this on God. The devil fell as lightning from heaven. He's the prince and power of the air. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God does not come to steal, kill, and destroy. So I have to tell the insurance company, you got, your, you got God and the devil mixed up. You're just trying to get out of paying. Now pay, you, pay the money. But the Lord gets blamed. So let's go on now. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4. And let's look at Paul again and some situations. 
This is a great verse right here, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure? We have Jesus Christ, God himself, and this earthen vessel. We're made of dust, right? Well, our bodies are made of dust. We came from the dust. We'll go back to dust. It's like the, the kid learned that in Sunday school, and he went home, and he's looking under the bed, and his mom said, what are you looking at? He said, somebody's either coming or going because there's a bunch of dust under the bed. <laughs> He knew that it came from dust and went back. He didn't know if God was making a new person or one was dying and going back to the floor again, getting dust mops going to get on. We had this treasure in earth and vessel, this hope of glory, this Christ within us, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So this power in me is of God, it's not of me. The reason I am more than a conqueror is because Jesus Christ is in me. The power is in me through Jesus Christ, his excellent power, not my power. But then he goes on and says this in verse 8. We are troubled on every side. Did you ever feel that way? Seriously, did you ever feel like, I don't have a, do you have a trial? No, I have multiple trials. I don't feel well. I'm sick. I have a family problem. Our finances are down. I lost my job. Everywhere I turn, on every side, there's trouble. No, I am not facing a trial. I'm being crushed on every side. He says, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Now, distress means suffering from anxiety, sorrow, and pain. So I might be troubled on every side, but if Jesus Christ is in me, when I have this treasure in earth and vessels, Jesus Christ is in me, I might be troubled on every side, but I'm not distressed. You don't seem very anxious, because I'm not. Jesus Christ is in me, and he promised to take care of me. In fact, he said he would supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, not my riches. You don't seem to have any sorrow over this. You just lost your job. You don't seem sorrowful. No, because I had to pass God, and he's got something better for me. He's going to work it out. And it might be a long period. Do you know how many people I've had come to me and say, I, we had more when I was out of work than when I worked. We had a couple that used to go here. They both lost their jobs for over a year, and they never lost their house, and they didn't lose their two vehicles. And they said, we had more financially when we lost our jobs than when we were working because God took care of us. See, you can't beat God. So the devil might mean something for evil, but God means it for good. And you can bet it's going to work together for good. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. If God is allowing it to happen, believe me, it couldn't happen if God didn't allow it. So if God allowed it, it's because he has something good for you, something better for you. You just have to sit back and don't be anxious and don't be in sorrow or in pain. Oh, this is so horrible. Just know that God is working it for good. Then he goes on to say, we are perplexed, but not in despair. Now, perplexed means completely baffled and puzzled. I'm in a fog. I don't even know what's going on. I, I feel like the world is crushed. I, I'm so perplexed. I, I'm puzzled. I, I can't understand, like, where's God? And no, we're perplexed. We're baffled. Paul says, I'm baffled by what's going on, but I'm not in despair. Despair is the complete loss or absence of hope. I'm not hopeless. I'm, I'm puzzled, but I still have total hope because my hope is in the Lord, not my circumstances. My hope is in Jesus Christ, and he is the same yesterday and today and forever. My circumstances have changed constantly all my life. And there's been ups and downs and twists and turns, and it's puzzling to the human mind. But I'm not giving up hope because my hope is in the Lord. And hope is desire with expectation to receive. I expect to receive this because my hope is in Jesus. Persecuted but not forsaken. Persecuted, you're subject to hostility and ill treatment because of your race because of your political position, because of your religious beliefs, mostly is what Paul went through, because he believed in Jesus and the resurrection, he was stoned, he was beaten with rods, he was beaten with stripes, he was shipwrecked, he was naked, he was hungry, he was cold, because he believed in Jesus. So he was persecuted but not forsaken. 
abandoned or deserted, Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So you can persecute all you want, but the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man will do to me because he will never abandon me. He will never desert me. Even people may walk away. Paul said, in my first call, nobody stood with me, but all forsook me. I pray, God, it will not be held to their charge. He accepted Christ, and even the apostles were afraid of him. Nobody would stand with him. And at the end of his life, in the Marmotine prison, when he's waiting to be beheaded, he said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Crescens is departed to, uh, he t told where all the different ones went. They went their way. He said, only Mark is with me. Incidentally, Mark had left him at one time during the gospel work because of persecution. But Mark came to the prison, and he had people who sought him out to bring him relief. That was at the end of his life. So he knows what it was, but Jesus Christ never forsook him. Now, we are cast down but not destroyed. Now, cast is a term that shepherds use for a sheep, and I've mentioned this before several times. When a sheep gets on its back, it cannot get back up on its feet again. Very seldom. It's very hard. And after a few hours, they'll die because they'll suffocate if they're on their back, especially a pregnant sheep. That's the worst one. Some sheep will manage to roll over and get up, but a pregnant sheep, when she lies down and rolls over, she cannot get back up, and she will die, and so will her young that are in her womb. That's why shepherds are always counting. When they say, oh, try counting sheep, it's not a joke. I, I have a micro farm in my yard and I have 11 ducks out there and when I go out because a, a fox got one, a hawk got one, I'm always going, I have names, they all know their names and I know them. And that's a small flock. But I go out and I'm there. All right, there's Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Spring. There's Mary and Martha and Lois and Eunice right there and the boys are here. So I'm, every time I walk out, I count because the hawk comes over almost every day. And so I'm always looking to see if he's lurking around. The enemy's always lurking to grab one of them. So I'm counting. Well, a shepherd does that, and Jesus is a good shepherd, and he's always looking to see if you're cast. If you're on your back and you feel like giving up, you feel like you're drowning in your troubles, Jesus is there to set you back up. He's always watching over you. So Paul said, we're cast down. He said, I'm cast, I'm on my back and I can't get up. I'm, I'm being overwhelmed, but I'm not destroyed. Destroy means to put an end to something's existence, as you may know. Well, Satan might want to destroy you. He, the thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Christ has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So I have abundant life through Jesus Christ. The devil doesn't win. If you haven't read the script, we have the whole script. You take the Bible in your hands. If you want to know how the plague works out, you can read the end of the story. The end of the story is we win. We always win. So, like, it's, it's great to have the story in your hand, to know the end from the beginning. God knows the end from the beginning, and he gave us the story of the end from the beginning. Guess what? Those who accept Christ win. We don't get destroyed. Praise God. Now, going on, let's go to chapter 7 now. I'm going to look at verse 5. This is the third incident with Paul. You say, well, if he's such a great apostle, how come he got discouraged? Everybody's tempted to get discouraged, and the more you're being used by the Lord, the more attacks are going to come against you, and you're tempted to get discouraged. But guess what? The Lord holds him up every time, doesn't he? When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced con conflict from every direction. There it is again every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside i've got battles everywhere i'm battling fear on the inside because yes i'm paul you're afraid you should be trusting jesus he is but the battle is to be afraid everybody gets tempted with fear sometimes and if you have i don't i won't believe you if you say i've never been tempted to fear you have everybody has been tempted to fear and maybe quite often so Paul said, the battle on the inside is I'm tempted to be scared. I'm really, I've got all this to face, and I'm really being fought with fear. And on the outside, there's battles that are very real. So it's inside, outside, in every direction. 
but God. <laughs> but God who encourages those who are discouraged encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. God calls a young pastor to show up, a brother in Christ to show up whom Paul had led to the Lord just at the time when he's saying, I'm tempted with fear, I'm tempted with discouragement. But you're the elder pastor. You shouldn't be scared. Oh, really? You think pastors don't get discouraged? You think prophets and priests and all didn't get discouraged? The battle is real for every human being. A title doesn't make you any different. Every human's the same. We just have different jobs to do. His presence was a joy, but so was the news he brought of the encouragement he received from you. He received from you people at his congregation that you were still, Paul said, that you're still loyal to me. He had written them a letter to correct the bad situation, and he thought they'd all turned against him, and Titus came and said, they're not against you. They still love you. They're still for you. You're a brother in Christ. And he was so encouraged by that because he thought, I've lost congregation. Everybody's against me. I'm a failure. All these battles are going on. Oh, I'm just a failure. I'm just no good. I'm worthless. My life means nothing. And the devil tries to do that when he gets your identity in what you're doing. Instead of in who you are, I'm a child of God. So if you lose your job, if you lose situations and positions, it doesn't change who you are. You're a child of God. That's your identity. And you do have a purpose. It's a different purpose. God changes our purposes at times. He has us doing one thing. Then we go through something that seems horrible, like your whole life fell in on you, and God's opening the door to a whole new thing where he's going to use you in a great way. We need not despair, but trust him and wait upon the Lord. Now I'm going to go back to chapter 1. We started with chapter 1 today, the trouble in Asia. Now I'm going to go back to chapter 1 and go to the top, up to, almost to the top, verse 3. We had started at verse 8. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant of our trouble that came to us at Asia, that we were pressed above measure, above strength, so much that we despaired of life. That was King James. Let's go back to verse 3 and see what he says. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Now, God may use a person as he did Titus to comfort you, but God is the source of all comfort. He uses people to comfort us, but it's from God. Now, let's continue down. He comforts us in all our troubles. He comforts us in all our troubles. You just feel the Lord's arms around you. Sometimes you say, I don't feel that. Well, you will. You'll notice that you're still here, right? You notice that you're still alive. You thought you wouldn't be eating by now. You thought you'd be homeless by now. You thought your marriage would be gone by now. You thought you'd be dead by now. But guess what? Guess who's holding you? He's holding you. Just be held. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So when you go through these situations that God comforts you, then when somebody else goes through it, you go, huh? I know what you're feeling. I can empathize. I can't just sympathize. I can empathize. Been there, done that. I've been so discouraged I couldn't even pray. I've been so discouraged I couldn't even speak. And God comforted me and let me tell you how good God is in your trouble. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. The more the devil pours it on, the more God pours it on. You talk about sufficient grace. That's why he told the devil in Job's case, he said, have at it. Have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, no wonder. You put an edge about him. You bless him with everything. He's the richest guy around. All right, take it from him. Don't touch his life. Oh, yeah. Have you considered my servant Job? Even though you allowed, I allowed you to touch him without a cause and you did all this, have you considered that he still keeps his integrity? Yeah, bone for bone, flesh for flesh. Let me touch his flesh. All right, touch his flesh. Don't take his life. Sore boils, afflicted him. His wife said, why don't you curse God and die? He still did it. Why? Who can live through that? Because God sustained him. God is always there. The more you pour it on Satan, 
the more I'm going to pour grace and strength on. You will never outdo my grace. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. God is with us. And when we suffer, it's just for your good because you'll see that God takes us through all these bad situations, that God is always faithful. He's always comforting. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives, with, gives us. Paul's saying, you know what? I know all this is happening, but the, the more that happens to us, the more it's for your salvation. It's a testimony to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And you know what? When you're going through trials, don't get discouraged. It's a testimony to your children. It's a testimony to your neighbors. It's a testimony to family members, to coworkers. How do you go through this? Because I have a God who is my father who's adopted me and he loves me and he never leaves me and he never forsakes me and he is faithful. It is a testimony. So let's praise God. We might be tempted to be discouraged, but the Lord will comfort us. He will lift us up and then we can comfort others with the same comfort wherewith we are comforted by Jesus Christ. Let's all bow our heads in prayer. Miss Leslie, would you lead us in prayer?